All right, let's do this one more time. Hey everyone, I'm Mao, and welcome to the Game Design Perspective. So, some of you love the last Sonic Lost Worlds video, some of you didn't, and some of you had questions regarding the level design of it. So, I decided to make a new video focused on the general level design of Sonic Lost World. We'll focus mostly on the progression of standard or normal levels. We will not dive into the boss levels, special levels or gauntlet levels. So we are going to take a look at them in a broad aspect. It does not mean those levels don't follow a similar study, but they do have some slight differences in them that make them stand out on their own. If you'd like a video diving into those aspects or diving deeper into the nitpicky aspects of the level design in Sonic Lost world let me know in the comments please sonic lost world merged sonic's boost level design with super mario's level design specifically galaxies but it's also very similar to 3d land and 3d world in many ways so that makes sonic lost world a very unique title it's the only one of its kind and for that i find it fascinating there's a lot to learn here so you're gonna be learning a lot with me here and let's dive in i hope you like it every game's level and game game design is completely dictated by its camera. This shows up strongly in Sonic Lost World. First, let's start talking about level section types or acts. And the first one is the outer tube. This is the main level section that Sonic Lost World became known for and with good reason. It is the star of many levels, including the very first level in the game, Windy Hill Zone 1. In the outer tubes, the camera always looks forward and Sonic can move left or right in them. When doing so, the tubes can loop or have walls to stop the loop. This type of level sections feature fast platforming. They are all about running forward and dealing with the platforming challenges right in front of you. And I think it is a good time to start talking about the blocky platforming found in this game. By blocky platforming, I mean that it's pretty easy to see the blocks where the gray box pieces that made up the level lie. And not that the levels are blocky or that there are no spherical planets. If you were to cut these tubes in half and leave them flat like in a flat surface, you'd see what I mean by blocky. The platforming challenges are very similar to Super Mario games. That's what I mean by blocky. You literally see blocks where you have or can jump. And that happens very often. We are dissecting their design. It is not something wrong. It is normal and it is fine. But we need to see beyond what the spherical aspect of the game is showing us. We need to dissect this. Something Sonic games usually do is that they streamline their platforming. Running and jumping parts of the level very often lead to a sprint that leads to the next part. This is done to keep the flow and speed going. This makes it different than Super Mario games. And there are a lot of what have crafted Sonic's platforming identity. They can alternate between a jump and a Spring. This game streamlines the platforming a little bit less than other Sonic games, but it streamlines it a lot still. These outer tubes usually have a golden or a main pad and some bonus pads. The golden pad is always the first one you're presented with, while the bonus pads require you to look into the left or right to find them. Often the bonus pads can lead into a small branching pad in this kind of sections. And we'll talk more about branching pads later. Later, guys don't worry about that the tubes usually lead to a spring at the end of them that will take sonic into the next section a lot of times in windy hill not always the golden pad is where there's grass pads laid on top of dirt are more of a bonus path that can take to a branching path the tubes are very clear on how the level is structured. The camera framing makes it super clear to read the challenges coming in the golden path. You can go back, but it's not easy to do so since the camera doesn't move. Normally, I think that's completely fine. Sonic is not usually about that kind of exploration. Sonic motivates going forward and fast. Branching paths in Sonic games usually motivate replayability instead of making the player going back to find those paths. These are 
are semilinear levels, going so far to even block you sometimes from going back to find them. And they can do this in many ways, but we can talk about that later. One of you mentioned in the last video that Frozen Factory has an explorable section featuring an outer tube. Honestly, due to the nature of their design, I find that section to be quite hard to explore. The camera just doesn't work or cooperate with you to explore the section, so it felt a little bit like an antithesis to the nature of the outer tube as the camera is just looking forward to frame the challenges to make you go fast. Then we have what I call the speedy outer tubes. This kind of section is featured in levels like Windy Hill Zone 1 as a bonus for finding it. The most common and famous example where this type of beat is found is in Desert Ruins Zone 2, also called Honeycomb Highway. A fantastic level, honestly. I know it's a boss level, I'm just using it because it's the best example of this type of level section. It is also used in the last boss. In this section, Sonic will run automatically. Sonic goes really fast and you as a player can't stop him. You can move Sonic left or right and double jump to avoid obstacles though. When they are used as level sections instead of entire levels, they are very short. They can be used as proper level beats or sections or can replace the springs that connect level sections. They are sometimes shaped like worms. These tubes can make funny shapes and are not necessarily like the previous standard tubes which is always straight. The next section is the outer tube thin pad. This kind of section is also featured in levels like Windy Hills on one, surprise, and it's also a bonus for finding it. These sections are very short and can vary between racing to the finish while following the thin pad without falling, or they can have a requirement where you have to achieve something to move on to the next section. For example, you have to gather butterflies to make the flowers spring, which will take you to the next section in Tropical Coast Zone 1. The next section are the clouds. They are featured, once again, surprise, in Windy Hill Zone 1, but are also also featured in many levels as well. These kind of level sections are the most platformy. Sonic bounces on clouds and never stops jumping, which makes them the slowest part of the levels since Sonic is not running and the beats generally last quite a bit. They tend to have a lot of rewards lying on plain sight. And this is done because you have less control over Sonic than usual. You can't really stop Sonic or move him at any moment. It requires timing to do so. You, you jump higher if you time the jump bottom as Sonic is about to bounce, so getting those rewards is a bit hard because of the skill it requires to do so. The next section is the freefall. It's incredible at this point how much Windy Hill Zone 1 features in a single level. It just goes to show how complete the level is as a first impression for the game. We're just gonna talk more about Windy Hill Zone 1 as a first impression later down in the video. This sort of level section is also used in Honeycomb Highway or Desert Ruins Zone 2. This kind of level section is very straightforward. The camera is placed on an over-the-head shot as you look and control Sonic while falling. You can make Sonic fall faster if you press the right trigger, and this section is all about avoiding obstacles and getting collectibles until you land on the next level section. It's fun and it's short. The next section is the inner tube. I've heard a lot of people hate this one zone. Honestly, not me, I find them to be quite fun. Let's change things a bit and stop featuring Windy Hill Zone 1 and say this type of section is featured in levels like Silent Forest Zone 3 as a variant or Sky Road Zone 4. It is also featured in The Legend of Zelda Zone. You know me guys, I'm a Zelda fan. This section is all about speed, very little, little platforming, Sonic can run left and right and loop inside the tube. Actually, most challenges involve looping inside the tube. They tend to connect to the next level section or inner tube by using springs. But there are some exceptions. They are also extremely short. The next one are the spherical planets. These ones are featured a lot too, but an example could be Silent Forest Zone 1. These planets are open and Sonic can run around them freely. The camera is once again placed in an over-the-head shot. This type of level sections usually have requirements to be fulfilled to move on to the next planetary section. These requirements can be beating all the enemies or reaching a switch or button or gathering the butterflies. Once the requirement has been achieved, something will show up that will carry Sonic to the next level section. The next one are 
the 2D sections or the side scrollers. They're featured a lot in the game, so much so that a lot of levels are completely 2D levels, like Windy Hill Zone 2 or the Joshi's Island Zone. In some levels, like one we'll talk about later, these 2D or side scroller sections are used by mixing 3D and 2D sections. They are usually based on platforming. They don't require Sonic to go fast necessarily unless they are auto scrollers. Usually it is the golden path, the one that doesn't require you to go fast, because going fast can be rewarded with a secret level beat that lead to a red ring. They feature a lot of bouncing on a sequence of enemies. If done successfully, they will also lead to red coin. They also hide a lot of secrets in a very Super Mario way. For example, if the level is indoors, there are rewards for looking in the ceiling or have hidden pathways that when getting in, the wall will become completely transparent to be able to see Sonic correctly. In broad terms, those are the kind of level sections that Sonic Lost World features. There are some beats that I didn't count as level sections because they belong to more special stages, such as the side-scroller gliding levels, where the level is an auto-scroller, where Sonic is always pushed to the top of the screen and you need to press the jump button to become a ball and go lower in the screen. I also didn't mention rails as level sections since they are used in outer tubes, inner tubes, and side-scroller sections. Also, rails are rarely used in normal levels and are often used in standalone rail levels that mix 2D and 3D in the sections described before and work as auto scrollers. What's interesting about rail grinding, and I'm gonna say it, is that contrary to the boost style games where changing rails is a scripted mechanic, in here you change lanes by jumping. Even rails are more platformy here than in the boost type rails, it's a very different kind of game. With those elements defined, let's talk about how the game uses them to create a sense of progression in a 3-act structure. Levels are usually based on one level section type specifically for the 3-act structure. This type of sections show up 3 times and offer a standard teach test challenge progression. Take for example, Windy Hill Zone 1, the first level of the game. This is how the acts would look like in a chart. Between each each act, there are giant springs that connect them. I don't count those springs as level sections because there is no actual gameplay involved. It's just an automated section to carry you to the next one. But this is only true for the golden or the main pad. The funky and interesting part here is what happens between the acts. For that, let's take a look at Desert Ruins Zone 1. Between or during acts, there is a connecting section. The connections in this level are always side scrollers. That means the standard outer tube shows up three times, but the connections show up between the main acts. This is how Desert Ruins Zone 1 looks like in a chart. Some levels use the same type of level section as connection between the main acts, where there is a progression between connections that follow a teach and test structure. Now, let's spice things up a bit and take a look at Tropical Coast Zone 1. This is how the chart in that level looks like. Like. The connection between Act 1 and Act 2 is just a set of strings for the golden path. But between Act 2 and 3, we see the level use thin paths, and there is an actual progression between both connections. What's funky is that after the second section of thin paths, there is another connection before reaching the goal, a cloud section. So that means that there are two connections between Act 3 and the goal. Weird, right? It's about to get even funkier. There is actually a bonus pad in Act 1 that leads to Act 2 as a branching pad. This bonus pad only takes place if the players find it. The branching pad eventually leads back to Act 2. So this is how the chart actually looks like. Let's go back and take a look at how Windy Hill Zone 1's chart actually looks like. The acts can be connected by speedy outer tubes, clouds, and thin pad outer tubes but they are mostly used as bonus paths. Some levels in the game use more than one kind of connection between acts. Windy Hill Zone 1 is more the exception to the rule, since in Act 2, there are two connections that can actually replace most of Act 2 in the level instead of them being used as ways to connect Act 2 and Act 
three. So the interesting part here is how they use the three act structure. And I believe they're doing this because they wanted to show as many features as possible in Windy Hill Zone 1. So connecting Act 1 and Act 2, we have a bonus or a standard branching pad. But on Act 2, you have that they can use connections as bonus pads and completely replace Act 2. I think it's just a way of them showing how the game will use these connections. They can use them in, in very funky ways. So the interesting part here is how they use the three act structure of the main path to decide if they will use just one sort of connecting section or multiple ones. If there are bonus or branching paths along the main section, they will lead to different kind of connecting sections, just like Windy Hill Zone 1. If the level doesn't really have a bonus path, then there will only be one kind of connecting section throughout the level, just like Desert Ruin Zone 1. Now, all of this is not necessarily a rule, but it's what's done most of the time. The designers were able to use the connections in very funky ways to spice things up a bit in this game. The overall progression is actually very structured, but the connections are what make the, every level feel so different between each other. They feel so crazy because it changes the overall feel of the level. The overall structure feels very funky again. Now let's go back to Desert Ruin Zone 1 and analyze its progression bit by bit. Desert Ruin Zone 1, again, the level has a 3x structure. We have a standard outer tube as the main level section, and that means it'll show up three times. And since there are no bonus paths, as far as I'm concerned, there will only be one kind of connecting section. In this level, it is a side-scroller, meaning it'll show up two times with a teach and test progression. With the general cadence of the level defined, let's talk about the main gameplay mechanic of each one of them. The main section, the outer tubes, as specified before, are fast beats, and they try to motivate going fast even more in this level. The main level mechanic in this section is the darker sand that slows Sonic down, so the level pretty much wants you to follow the established light colored sand to go as fast as possible. There are some accompanying level mechanics that support this. The first one are the arrowed moving bands that carry Sonic from light colored sand to feet into the next one. Then we have worms that come out of the ground and giant rolling cactus. Both of them are really only obstacles which Sonic mustn't touch. The worms just stay there while the line of cactus roll in circles and can have a collectible right at the center of them in a way to incentivize the players to deal with them. To motivate players into dealing with harder bonus bits in the level, there are ramps that if used correctly will make Sonic fly over dark sand beats. It's not a proper level mechanic, but they are used concurrently throughout the level and I thought it was worth mentioning here. There are also standard enemies, just to spice the challenges a bit up. Now, how do these mechanics create a sense of progression throughout the level? Let's talk about that. In Act 1, the dark colored sand is only there to make you go slow. It doesn't really have any challenge but that. The arrowed moving bands are introduced in a friendly manner. At first, they show up as bonus little paths that eventually Sonic is forced into taking one of them into a safe environment. Giant cactus show up in a very interesting way. The first time they show up, they hide a little bonus ramp behind them, but they are really there not to avoid them and keep on going your way, but to make you decide if you want to go left or right. You are forced into learning to avoid them. And the visual language suggests you to go right. There is light color sand contrary to the left one. And usually we relate going right to moving forward and left with moving backwards. If you go left, then you are forced into dealing with their timing to escape the situation unharmed, but are rewarded with an extra life. Giant worms are only really presented to us in a safe environment. We never really deal with them. And that's it for level mechanics in Act 1. Let's talk about Act 2. Here, dark sand evolves in some parts and is now quicksand, which now drags you and is a challenge that presents proper danger to Sonic. Arrowed bands start having multiple paths that may lead to bonus pad or the golden pad. Not many, but it's a start. Also, they are closer to enemies now. Giant cactus, interestingly, don't show up in the second act. I find it very interesting when I saw this. I mean, it's not a big deal. The level establishes the light and dark sand that evolves into quicksand as as the main level mechanic. It works as a little dotted line that creates a sense of progression for us. It is a spotlight and it works by the book in the level. Giant worms start showing up as a real threat in the golden path. 
and even hide bonus paths now. They work as obstacles that you have to avoid and they are big. Up to Act 3, giant cactus make up for their lack in Act 2 and show up big time here. The moment you get into Act 3, you see a bunch of them. And what Act 3 does is that it starts mixing level mechanics together. It is a very common practice in platformer games. Dark sand is, is mixed with giant rolling cactus, so if you get stuck in the sand, you are in actual danger. It is mostly used in bonus paths with speed boosters, but it is there and it increases the difficulty of the level by a lot. Quicksand starts getting mixed up with the giant worms. These worms show up to make you choose between left or right or straight up avoid them while not getting caught up in the quicksand. Arrow bands now have a lot of paths and some of them leading to spikes. If you're not careful and keep moving, you will fall into them. Spikes are pretty obvious and tested by this point in the game and also in gaming in general, so it doesn't really feel unfair to place them here and mix them with these arrowed bands. Those paths and spikes lead to a bonus bell. Also, the camera of the level makes it very easy to see where the arrowed band will lead you. So it also feels like your mistake if you fall into the spikes. As for the connections, they have a two-act structure for this level, Desert Ruin Zone 1. Since both connections share the same type of level section, being side-scrollers, they have a similar structure and a theme. This side-scroller sections require Sonic to platform and parkour his way up. Both sections are actually some of the most vertical level sections in the entire game. Also, the worms are much more relevant here, since they are there to pressure Sonic into going up or making Sonic wait for the right time to proceed with the challenge. The progression in these sections are based on, again, a three-act structure, a miniature one. There are three worm challenges per connection, and the difficulty increases as you move forward with these challenges. Using the worms in these sections was actually very interesting. They make this level feel Feel like one of the most cohesive ones in the entire game in my opinion. So when you place these connections between the main acts and they have a similar theme to them but a different gameplay style, it works somewhat like a five act structure, something not seen very often in games actually. It's very interesting. Each connection by itself teaches, tests and challenges a player, but in conjunction both connections they have like a two act structure way they teach and test the player. But now that you mix them with the main acts, makes the entire level feel like a nice chef's kiss from the designer to make it feel even more complete and cohesive. It doesn't mean the level is perfect by any means, or that it doesn't have its flaws. But as themes and progression go, it is actually a very interesting and unique one. Alright, so with that we have seen how in general Sonic Lost World handles its difficulty, how they handle the level structure, Overall, it's a very general level design study. To study these games level design, we could take an entire afternoon or a day or I don't know how many videos, honestly. I do think it's a very well place to start to study these games level design. If you want to see more of these games level design, if you want me to get into the nitpicky, if you want me to see more about this game or any other game you want me to take a look at the level design, if it's Sonic, if it's The Legend of Zelda, Super Mario, Final Fantasy, you tell me. If you want me to start analyzing level design like this, please let me know. These videos take a lot to make. They, they require a lot of a study. And as you know, this is not our main job, right? Santi and I both have like our jobs in the gaming industry. So this is pretty much done in our spare time so if you like this video please leave a like comment and subscribe so with that i'll leave you guys to it i hope you liked it and i'll see you guys on the next one